Today, we will honor two truly distinguished individuals whose many noteworthy contributions will be acknowledged by the conferring of an honorary degree from the University of the Sciences. I call upon Dr. Kate Mays, Vice Chair of the Board of Trustees, to present our first nominee for the honorary degree of Doctor of Science. Kate. Thank you, Mr. President. Welcome to graduates, families, and friends. James C. Appleby is the executive director and CEO of the Gerontological Society of America, the nation's leading professional membership organization devoted to education, research, and practice in one of the largest and growing segments of our population, the aging. Mr. Appleby was born and raised in Mount Union, Pennsylvania. His parents were both pharmacists, and they met and graduated from one of our colleges, the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy and Science, as it was known at the time. <clears throat> of the six children in his family, only one, our honoree, James, became a pharmacist. At age nine, James's father died, and James's mother had to return to pharmacy practice and operate their pharmacy while raising her children. James credits the leadership qualities of both of his parents for much of his ability in leading organizations. And he credits mentors from the University of the Sciences and PCP that continued to shape and hone his leadership skills. Mr. Appleby graduated magna cum laude in 1987 with a pharmacy degree from the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, then pursued his Master's of Public Health degree from Temple University, right here. Early in his career, he was a hospital pharmacist at Presbyterian Division of Penn Medical and later at Jeans Hospital. He also served on the faculty and as the Assistant Director of Continuing Education of PCP. He currently also serves on the PCP Board of Visitors. Mr. Appleby is best known as an innovator and entrepreneur who excels at transforming organizational cultures. Since joining the GSA staff in 2008, he has focused the organization on advancing innovation in aging. He has built multiple non-dues revenue generating initiatives, including projects related to detecting cognitive impairment, communicating effectively with older patients, pain ma management, and much more. The society's new national adult vaccination program focuses on improving immunization rates across the life course. Before coming to GSA, Mr. Appleby had a 17-year career with the American Pharmaceutical Association, APHA, the 60,000-member professional association representing pharmacists and pharmacy students. He served in a variety of roles, including Doctor of, Director of Education, Publisher, and Vice President of Industry Relations before being appointed Chief Operating Officer and Senior Vice President of Business Strategy. Among his other accomplishments at APHA, he was a principal architect of the APHA-sponsored pharmacy-based immunization delivery training program. This is used by pharmacy chains and schools of pharmacy nationwide to prepare pharmacy students and pharmacists to immunize patients. This innovative program, which showcases the patient care role of the pharmacist, has dramatically improved immunization access for millions of Americans. In addition, Mr. Appleby spearheaded the APHA Self-Care Institute, providing pharmacy educators with the latest self-care therapeutic information and the APHA Pain Management Partnership which highlighted the role of pharmacists in ensuring appropriate pain care. Mr. Appleby also oversees the establishment of the association's highly popular certificate training program series and the introduction of Pharmacy Today, the association's news magazine, now celebrating its 20th anniversary. 
Well, if that's not all, Mr. Appleby continues to be very active in the pharmacy profession, serving as vice chair of the District of Columbia Board of Pharmacy. He's a member of APHA, the, so the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists, the Washington DC Pharmacists Association, and the American Geriatric Society, and the American Public Health Association. He lives in Washington DC with his wife, Sarah Martin, and son, Alexander. Mr. President, I am proud to present to you our first distinguished honoree for the Doctor of Science degree, Mr. James C. Appleby. On the recommendation of the nominating committee and with the approval of the Board of Trustees, and by virtue of the authority granted this institution and vested in me by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, I confer on you, James C. Appleby, the degree of Doctor of Science, honoris causa, with all the rights, privileges pertaining thereto, in testimony thereof, I ask that you be invested with the hood symbolic of the degree and present you with the official diploma. Please join me in congratulating our honorary degree recipient, James Appleby. Thank you, Kate, <clears throat> for that very, very warm and generous introduction. President Sampson, members of the board, distinguished faculty, students, family, and friends. I can't tell you how absolutely overwhelming and humbling it is to be recognized by an institution that I love and that has been an integral part of my family's life over three generations. As Kate said, my mother and father met here at Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, but she didn't mention that in addition to that, both of my grandfathers attended the university as well. So I have the privilege of being a third generation alumni. This is an extraordinary honor for me, but really today is your day, the class of 2015. So I offer my hearty congratulations to each of you and to each of your family members and friends and loved ones who are with you today to celebrate because this is about them as well. They're a big part of how it is you ended up being uh, so successful that you could graduate today from the University of the Sciences. I'm thrilled to have some of my uh, own family with me today and some dear friends to help me celebrate what is a truly, truly special day in my career. And as I reflect on what it is I might share with you from my experiences since leaving uh, this institution, um, I thought about a couple of different important themes, one of which is to talk with you about the amazing demographic transformation that's underway in this country. You may not be aware of it, but the United States is aging and aging rapidly, and that's the field that I'm in. Every day, every day, 10,000 people turn 65. And I thought I might talk with you about how, what that means is during your professional careers, you're going to be caring for more older adults than any generation of graduates in the history of the youth sciences. And what that would mean for you and the skills you're gonna to have to develop. I also thought that perhaps this would be a good time to talk with you about the fact that your degree from youth science is, is liberating and not limiting. The skills that you have in this degree opens up many doors for you. As I'm a case in point, having worked in hospital pharmacy, having worked uh, at the college, and then going on to work at the American Pharmacists Association, and then ultimately bridging my skills over to work for a, an organization that is in the area of aging research. Your degree can open those doors. Your degree does not close any doors. But then as I reflect a little bit more, I thought about this scientifically educated audience and what you'd really like to hear about. And I said to myself, you know, 
I think what I really want to share with you today is some of my thoughts about soccer. Or as they say in the rest of America, or the rest of the world, I should say, football. You see, I'm the youngest of six children, and we are all sports fans. Growing up, we had the opportunity to have season tickets to the Philadelphia Eagles. So every Sunday, we'd drive three and a half hours to a game, see it and go back. And we are frequent visitors to Phillies games. Now, you'd imagine as the baby of the family that maybe I would have the same sort of zest for baseball and football that my siblings did. Now, I, I like them. There's nothing wrong with baseball or football, but I love soccer. And I have to tell you, <laughs> good, good, good to know we've got some soccer fans in the audience. Um, now, I have to tell you, as you may imagine, on Sunday afternoons, being a fairly competitive family, it would often lead to debates about the merits of different sports. And I would always be on the losing end of the arguments, all right? Because soccer, let's face it, if you don't like it, it can seem a bit dull. People running around for 90 minutes or more without scoring a goal. Well, um, those of us uh, in the know, we realize how amazing soccer is. Um, and I think one of the reasons why why I like soccer so much is that I believe that of all the sports, soccer is the one that most imitates life. And I've actually given a little bit of thought, uh, thought to this, and I, let me tell you why I think soccer imitates life. First of all, in soccer, the clock doesn't stop. It starts and it just keeps ticking. And it doesn't matter if someone gets injured, it doesn't matter if uh, someone scores a goal or there's a penalty kick or the ball goes out of bounds, or even for television ads, it doesn't stop, it just keeps ticking. And that's a lot like life, all right? Uh, life keeps going forward without interruption. The game with soccer ebbs and flows. People are uh, going up and down the field for 90 plus minutes, it takes a remarkable amount of resilience. The team members have to play offense and defense. A lot like life, you have to keep going forward. There are no special teams that are going to come in and help you out in a particular situation. You need to play the entire game. Now, sometimes in soccer games, referees make really bad calls that go against you. And sometimes they make really bad calls that go in your favor, all right? But it typically evens out in the end. There's no instant replay. It's whatever the referee decides. And that is a lot like life. There are plenty of times when there are incorrect judgments made against you, but just as often, doesn't it seem like you get a break that maybe you're not sure you deserved? And from time to time during soccer games, soccer players get fouled, but the referee ignores it. The referee looks, sees it, acknowledges it, but ignores it, does not enforce the law, the rule, because doing so would give the team that was committing the offense the upper hand and would uh, derail the game. And what they do is they motion, they say, no, we, I saw the offense, but we, everyone play on. They want the game to go forward. And doesn't that happen plenty of times in life? You're somehow aggrieved and you really have no recourse. There's nothing you can do about it. Uh, so you have to play on. Perhaps your boss says, yeah, I understand, but you're just gonna have to deal with it. That's the way it is. And it reminds me of something that a professor from U Sciences uh, used to say. He said that life is not the way it's supposed to be. Life is the way it is. And it's how you cope with it that counts. Now every so often, soccer, not often enough, many would say, they actually score a goal. And you would think that when that happened, they had just won the lottery. They go crazy. And if anyone has ever actually seen a soccer match, you know what I'm talking about. Well, that's how it is as well in life. Sometimes you score a really big goal, and this is one of them for you, the graduates, the class of 2015. And I hope you're going to celebrate in a big way. Now, the last two ways that I believe soccer imitates life are perhaps the most important. In soccer, you don't know how much time you have left in the game. What I mean by that is the clock ticks up to 90 minutes, it stops, but the game continues. The referee decides at his or her sole discretion how much extra time to add 
for penalties, for substitutions, for goal celebrations that wasted time, for injuries. It's called injury time or extra time. It could be two minutes, it could be five minutes, it could be 20 minutes. So what that means is the players have to keep going forward without actually knowing when the game is going to end. They have to stay focused to the very end. And that, I believe, is a lot like life. We've got to stay focused to the very end. And I believe that this seems especially important in today's age of immediate communications with emails and text messages and Instagram and Snapchat. There are all these interruptions that cause us to lose our focus, that cause us to uh, not sort of be aware of, of where we are, to not breathe in the moment, a moment like, uh, like this today. And I suspect for some of the graduates out there, it's been a struggle uh, not to check your, your cell phone. And uh, I, can, I can report to the audience that for a couple of you, you were not able to resist the urge while you're sitting here. It's okay. However, um, I think the phrase, and it's uh, often used, there's no time like the present, captures what today's day of immediate communication is about. There's no time re for reflection. It's all now, now, now. And I, I think that that phrase is, is an issue for all of us because in a world in which we don't know when the game is going to end, I think we have to think differently about time and about our focus. And this was really brought out very nicely in a recent movie, uh, which I encourage you to see. It's called The Second Best Exotic Marigold Hotel. It just sort of rolls off the tongue. If you've uh, not seen it, I encourage you to see it. It's a very uh, funny movie with a wonderful cast. It's set in India. And it, during the course of the movie, uh, one of the characters uh, says to the, to the lead character, and th th for this character, uh, it's someone who, for whom English is a second language. And uh, he says, uh, in, instead of saying that uh, there is no time like the present, he says, there is no present like the time. There is no present like the time. And you think at the, in, the, in the movie at first, well, oh, this is uh, because English is not his first language. He's gotten it mixed up. Well, in fact, it becomes evident in the movie that he knows exactly what he was talking about. And what he was saying is that making time, real time, real undistracted time for his loved ones was the most important thing to him. There is no present like the time. And we all think we can multitask in today's world. Uh, we believe that we can type a, te a text message while we're in a conversation with a friend or log something into a patient's chart on the computer while we're trying to listen to the patient's uh, concerns. But we can't, and you all know the neuroscience better than I do, but the part of the brain that processes things when you're typing messages is the same part of the brain that processes incoming uh, audio uh, information when someone's talking. So we really can't multitask, and we certainly can't multitask if we really want to provide the people who are important in our, our lives with the present of time. And those people include our spouses, our partners, uh, our friends, our parents, uh, relatives, and patients. And in particularly, in this case, at the University of the Sciences, our patients who deserve your attention when you're providing care for them. Now, the final way that soccer imitates life, I believe, actually happens after the game. After the game, especially in international matches, you'll see soccer players actually run to the sidelines and thank the supporters, their fans, their biggest fans that throughout the course of the long afternoon were cheering them on. They'll literally come to the sidelines and clap for them and say thank you. You don't see that too often in baseball or football, let's face it. So today, I'd like to express my gratitude to some important people in my life. First, to President Sampson, to the members of the Board of Trustees, faculty, students of the University of Sciences, thank you. Thank you for this wonderful honor. I've been blessed with many mentors in my life, especially quite a number here at the University of Sciences, some of whom are still on the faculty and some who have left the faculty. They included Brian Russell, Janice Gaska, and John Gans, all pharmacists who 
taught me a lot about pharmacy, but perhaps more importantly, a lot about leadership. And Bill Rhinesmith, who taught me an enormous amount about the importance of reflection and the, and the inner life. Professor Ken Leibowitz, who has been a constant touchstone to me over almost 30 years, and who instilled in me the importance of always in putting quality into everything that I do. And of course, Dr. Daniel Hassar, an individual who for all of us provides a professional mentor, a role model to attempt to emulate. And those of you who have had the opportunity to be his student, you are truly blessed. The undivided attention that all of these individuals provided me during my career has made all the difference to me in my life. I'd also like to say thank you to my absolute favorite University of the Sciences graduate, my mom. Elizabeth E.B. Appleby, class of 1952, and she's with us today, just over here. When she graduated from the University of the Sciences, then it was the Philadelphia College of Pharmacy, there were 179 graduates, and 13 of them were women. So th think about the... <laughs> she was truly a trailblazer and an amazing woman who, as you heard my introduction, raised six children successfully after the death of my father when I was just nine. She has said several times uh, over her life the importance that her pharmacy degree from the University of Sciences, what it meant, her ability to step into a career, uh, to be a pillar of the healthcare community in our small town, and it contributed enormously to the successful life that she has led. Finally, I'd like to say thank you to my siblings and my, and my friends. Uh, I've been blessed with five amazing siblings who, while I can't get them to agree on soccer, have supported me on everything else that I've done in my life, and I'm honored to have them uh, as brothers and sisters. And to my friends, uh, some of whom are able to be here today, to Ed and Corinne, to Karen, to Dwayne, and to Roseanne, they have been a constant source of support for me during my career, uh, both uh, professionally and personally. And finally, I want to say thank you to my wonderful spouse and partner, Sarah Martin, for her support over the past 20 years, and to our amazingly creative son, Alexander. I learn from each of them every day, and they just make life fun. Thank you. And so today, I really wasn't trying to turn you into soccer fans. Today, but I do hope that after today, and maybe along the course of life, maybe when you're watching a football game on TV, or maybe when you're going to a soccer match that your son or daughter has, you might take a moment and just reflect on the many blessings you've received, including an excellent education at the University of Sciences and have gratitude for all the blessings that you have, and that maybe you'll also remember that there is no present like the time. Giving the gift of undistracted time to those you love and to your patients will make all the difference in their lives and in yours. Congratulations to the class of 2015. Today, is a big milestone in, in your game of life, and I encourage you to celebrate and play on. Thank you.